th thank you all for uh, for coming here. I think I will I will uh, so we start with this uh, with this panel because we we don't have that much uh, time. So this is uh, this is a panel on content regulation and its impact on uh, democracy, uh, neatly aligning with the general theme of uh, the CPDP conference this year: data protection and, and democracy. Um, so clearly, internet platforms have become very important in facilitating and mediating public discourse and debate. And um, because of the uh, central uh, role of platforms, they've also become maybe increasingly targets for uh, disinformation campaigns. And uh, they have been, of course, also the target of calls for taking more responsibility with respect to illegal content online and disinformation. So this panel will be uh, looking into some of those questions. We have an incredible lineup of speakers and a great moderator who will we'll introduce momentarily. So some of the questions that we will look in, into at this panel are what are the policy implications of co-opting private entities to regulate speech? How easy or difficult is it to recon recognize non-authentic content or accounts? You know, and of course, like maybe the issue also of state propaganda, a particular form of speech that has been causing problems. Can content verification tools help address problems of misinformation? And are voluntary codes of conduct, such as the code of conduct that has been um, uh, developed uh, here in the European Union context, are they, could they be seen as a way to circumvent the prohibition of general monitoring obligations under Article 15 of the e-commerce directive? So these are just some of the starting uh, questions uh, for thinking um, about this discussion. So we have a moderator, Guillermo Beltra. He is uh, leading Access Now's policy team globally in their mission to defend and extend human rights in the digital age. Uh, Guillermo, uh, was working before Access Now. He was the director of legal and, e legal and economic affairs at the European Consumer e Organization, BIUC, uh, based here in Brussels, the largest NGO defending consumer rights in Europe. Then our last speaker, but I want to mention her first because she's the organizer of this panel and did a great job on that, the Dr. Alexandra Kucheravi. She's a senior research fellow at the Center for IT and IP Law at KU Leuven, Belgium, and she is an expert in the area of freedom of expression and intermediary liability. Then our first speaker, speaker will be Jochen Spangenberg from Deutsche Welle and the WeVerify project. Jochen works for Germany's international public broadcaster Deutsche Welle and his topical focus is social news gather and verification of digital content and is involved in a variety of projects in the area of information quality, news quality and um, uh, truth verification. Our second speaker will be Marisa G uh, Jimenez Martin, who is um, trained as a Spanish lawyer in the University of Zaragoza and specialized in EU law. Um, she uh, has 20 years of public policy experience, worked for the European Commission, uh, worked for uh, uh, Google, leading uh, Google's privacy policy strategy in Brussels and Mountain View and joined Facebook in February last year as a director of public policy and the deputy head of EU affairs. Then we have uh, Annie Hellman from the European Commission. She's the deputy head of unit for media conversions and social media in uh, DG Connect um, and is trained as a mathematician, which is very, very happy to hear about because that's the same uh, for me. So I think with that, uh, I will hand over the um, uh, microphone to, uh, to our moderator. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, Joris, and good morning, everybody. I'm very happy to be today your content moderating algorithm. I'll promise to be as transparent and accountable as you want, so you can come later and ask me why I take all the decisions I might take today. Um, just maybe a, a very quick word on Access Now. Uh, like Joris said, we are a global digital rights NGO, um, and we have colleagues in every continent and we work on a vast array of issues from privacy data protection to freedom of expression. It's a very particular focus for us. Uh, any type of discrimination, internet shutdowns. And through our global work, we follow the conversation on disinformation very closely. And that is one of the points that I first wanted to share today because this is a widespread phenomenon that is not just about, oh, how did Trump get elected or what happened with Brexit. This is happening all around the world at many different levels. Um, there are stories about 
uh, false reporting in the ongoing conflicts in Ukraine. There are violent and deadly attacks that have been uh, attributed to spread of false information in India, Indonesia, and Sri Lanka. Um, this is not just about Europe, and, but today we're, go we're gonna focus on Europe. Um, as access now, we take, I just wanna kind of spell out very quickly the, gra the, the key points of what we think should are the do's and don'ts. The first thing that we, sh that we think we should not do when dealing with the disinformation phenomenon is rush through a, a solution that is just like a big solution that we think is gonna, is gonna help. Um, and we should also not try to attempt to regulate what is good speech and what is bad speech. Instead, forgetting about silver bullets, we need nuanced policy making that, for example, first uh, looks at the channel of why is this information spreading around the world. And, and there we have a very clear uh, target to deal with, which is the mainstream online advertising business model. And in Europe, through the ongoing conversations on e the e-privacy regulation and through other tools, like for example, uh, sector inquiry that the European Union could do, we could look at how the advertising business model functions as a multiplier of this information. Um, the other thing we observe is that we don't have enough comparative tools to analyze the data that we're seeing. So every time there is a policy attempt to deal with the disinformation phenomenon, um, the, the we cannot compare the different ex poli policy experiments that we're seeing. So that would be very helpful. With that, I just want to let our panel of experts uh, introduce their thoughts. We're gonna start for, uh, with Jochen from Deutsche Welle. Thank you. Thank you very much, Guillermo. I'm just gonna go over here because I prefer standing when I talk. Could I just move here? Oh, let's just turn it around so we don't. So it's a microphone, it's working, you can hear me, and now I just have to set my time as well so I don't overrun. <laughs> Thanks very much for having me here. Yes, the slides are on. Let's go and press the time button. So, thanks for the introduction. Thanks for inviting me. I'm going to talk a bit about this misinformation space from a media perspective, from a news media provider. And as has been said, I work for Deutsche Welle Germany's international public service broadcaster. We provide content services in 30 different languages. Now, there is a lot of value in digital content that is residing in social networks. You see some examples. I mean, you can think of thousands of examples, be it catastrophes, natural catastrophes, wars, attacks like the one here in the center in Brussels, or the photo, the video on the right is taken from the recent tsunami in Sulawesi. So there's lots of value for news providers like ourselves in accessing this content and using that for news gathering and also for the reporting process. But as with everything in life, there's also downsides. As you also know, there's lots of misinformation circulating on social networks. Some of it is actively manipulated, like the one in the middle, or other stuff is taken out of context, pretending something that it isn't. For example, on the left, this was not the coup in Turkey, but it was Syria 2013. So we see this again and again and again. And the fact that this has an impact just is meant to be illustrated by this slide here. Um, this is in the run-up to the US election, but I'm sure we're gonna talk about that also in the discussion that follows. Now, what do we, Deutsche Welle, as a public service broadcaster, do in that space? And here I'm primarily speaking on, the, on behalf of the unit that I'm heading, which is the Research and Cooperation Projects Unit, but I come to that in a moment. So we're not in the business of baking bread or making bread or selling bread now, but our, our daily bread is news provision. So that means verification and fact-checking has been at the core of our business for decades. So it's nothing new. But what is new is using content residing in social networks. And to do so, we started um, our work in 2013. And thanks here go to the European Commission. I mean, Annie is not paying me for it, but they, the European Commission, funded this project reveal very early on, namely in 2013, to deal with algorithm-supported verification of social media content. And another disclaimer, Alexandra was also part of it and said that's how we know each other. So 2013, nobody was talking fake news, or very few people were talking about that. So the Commission was very far-sighted. 
Another project we've been involved in is called INVIT, and INVIT just com uh, was completed a few months ago at the end of the year. And just two outcomes of this project, one, the one in the middle you see there, is a sort of professional platform for verification, whereas on the left you see a so-called plugin that we created, and that's being used by over 9,000 people, human rights activists, journalists and so on, so anybody can use it. It's, it, it's a plugin that is downloadable for free, and like I say, 9,000 users is quite an impressive um, number, I find. Then, based on all the learnings, and this time not with EU funding, we developed a collaborative verification platform called Truly Media. We did that together with a commercial company, ATC, in Athens and Greece, and that is, for example, used in our newsroom, but also by others like Amnesty International in their human rights work. Um, and we are continue. Oh, oh no, this is just like very briefly on what truly media is. I have no time to go into details, but if you're interested, talk to me afterwards. It's about finding content, so content that is residing in social networks, but also elsewhere. Then it's organizing that content into topical areas, and the final step then is the verification of this content. So it's partly manual and it's part partly algorithm supported. Now we're continuing also our. Um, verification work in EU-funded project, and this is a project that was just started at um, the beginning of December called We Verify, and there, among many other things, we're using that platform Truly Media and enhance it with further features and components that are, again, algorithm-supported. And another project to mention, it's something we are not involved in direct directly, but this is a project that is meant to bring all these verification fact-checking initiatives together and we as Deutsche Welle and ATC, we are providing the platform Truly Media for journalists and whoever wants to use it um, in a sort of lightweight version. Um, now, I've talked a lot about cooperation, something like that also has to be mentioned. You see here, First Draft News is an initiative that is quite active in that space. We are a member of it, I'm the representative, so we are cooperating with them. Same goes for the EBU, the Eurovision Social Newswire, which is again an, um, a cooperation of public service broadcasters that work on this together. But there's also the other side, and we have to be honest about it, journalists don't always want to cooperate, especially if you, if you have a scoop or a breaking story there's limits as to what journalists really want to share, because after all, you're also competing for eyeballs and for audiences' attention. Am I running for time? Right, so this is just a brief overview of what we do, what we have done in the past, mainly in terms of technology uses for verification. Now, just already summing up or some final comments and final remarks. That's what I have to do still quite a lot and that's preaching. I'm not preaching you to you today, but uh, when I'm standing in front of journalists, uh, there's still a lot of preaching involved because although you might think they all know how to handle digital content, it's not always the case. So you have to do a lot of teaching, preaching, raising awareness, but not only with journalists, but also with management because you can't do it at the same time. You need to make available extra time and you also need to train people. Another thing where I'm preaching a lot is when it comes to media literacy. I think that's one of the very, very important areas that more needs to be invested. If you have kids, I do, I have two, and they know how to operate these devices, but I don't necessarily understand the underlying dynamics on also business models. So just um, another disclaimer, I also support and work for, in my free time, for an organization called Lie Detectors that does exactly that, going into schools and teaching young kids from age 10 onwards about how this all um, involves, but also that journalists are human beings and make mistakes. But there's, there's a difference between making a, a mistake and deliberately misleading your audience. Now, this one here, just again summing up, there is certainly, and we'll come to that surely in the discussion, there's a role for social networks to play in all this in this ecosystem. That's the top left photo. But while everything is digital, we mustn't forget, and that's what I also preach to journalists, old established and useful tools and technologies. And that's meant to be symbolized by that machine at the bottom left. A phone is an extremely useful tool. So if somebody is telling you some story and you're not sure, ring that person and talk to them. Because if it's made up, you can very quickly tell whether that person is telling a true story or is just making that up. So do not discard old established established and very valuable tools like a telephone. Then the legal aspect is also something that is very often overlooked when it comes to rights issues, but also privacy, and that's why probably most of you are here, privacy issues and so on. So there's always somehow a dilemma 
using all that data, using what, what is residing in search networks on the one hand, and of course researchers and journalists would like to use it all. On the other hand, there are legal limitations. So that has to also be taken into account. And the bottom, that's something I'm always stressing when I'm talking at events like this, is the ethical dimension. So it's two-sided. On the one hand, for users who, who have to watch or who do watch, who are exposed to so-called gruesome or disturbing images, but also journalists, because they have to be protected. So the effects it can have on the, on, the, on the psyche can be tremendous. And this must not be forgotten. And this is really an issue for managers to protect their teams, their journalists, from exposure to such content, for dealing with it, and taking appropriate measures. And this brings me, yeah, brings me to the end. Um, so our business model as a public service broadcaster is this. It's based on trust. So we have to earn trust again and again. Sometimes we lose it. So, but that's something we have to work on every day, day in, day out. And without trust, our business model is destroyed. And this is the end from my side. I'm, I see I've run, overrun by a minute and a half, so I'm sorry. So we are available for questions. Thanks very much. Is this back on? Yes. Thank you, Jochen. Uh, very interesting presentation to set the scene. Uh, next up is Marisa from Facebook. Thank you. I think I'm going to stay here because there's, there's more <laughs> light. Seems to be a bit dark over there. So thanks, um, uh, thanks very much to the to, to the chair and uh, Alexandra for inviting me uh, to this panel. I really we don't have very much time, so I want to uh, dig in on the subject. I think that uh, the first thing to say is that Facebook does not want any fake news uh, on the platform. And it's very clear uh, our users uh, don't want it, and it's not good for business either. Uh, we've been making significant efforts and investments both in uh, preventing the dissemination uh, of fake news and also in uh, high, quality, uh, high quality content on the platform. But combating fake news is something that not one single company can do. I think that that's also very clear. Uh, we can only win this battle if we work together both uh, at, at all levels, with governments, industry, uh, civil society, the research community, because there is no silver bullet for this, and I think that Guillermo also uh, mentioned that, that expression. Fake news has been long a problem and a tool for economic and political gain. What is new is the way in which uh, in the methods that have been used, um, and, and in, the, in particular case, the way that pl uh, online platforms have been used for the dissemination of fake news. It's uh, you've seen and you know that there's spammers that use uh, fake news to yield economic benefit, but there are also bad actors, as we all know, that uh, have used it to uh, influence um, political and electoral processes. We're all thinking here about the elections at the European Parliament that are coming uh, this spring. At Facebook, we're tracking more than 100 elections this year. So there's a lot to do. So what do we do about it? Um, it in, in short, we have a, a, a three-tiered approach here. The first thing is what can we do through uh, our product? So what product changes we can make to address uh, the issue? And all the product changes that we're making are informed by one thing, and is that, that is to get more transparency. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the, uh, the changes that we're doing to political uh, advertising. The second uh, uh, point here is informing and empowering the consumer. Uh, misinformation is fought with more information and context. And also media literacy. We have to do more efforts. We've started, we've done uh, a lot, but we have to do a lot more uh, to, to facilitate media literacy. And cooperation. Cooperation with third parties, third uh, uh, party uh, fact checkers, agencies and governments. For instance, uh, we've just made a, an announcement of um, uh, a project with BSI in Germany to, uh, to fight um, uh, foreign government interference in elections. Uh, last but not least, partnering with the research community, of course, because we all need to know more about what's happening online, what's happening on the platform, and learn from it and be accountable. So if I can just talk about exactly what is the strategy, what, what do we do in, in general terms when we, when we address fake news. First, um, above most, 
is to disrupt bad actors. So indeed, when you look at uh, uh, fake news, you look at you could look at content, but you mainly look at the uh, at the actors. We uh, uh, authenticity is key uh, to the integrity of the service. So we require that um, uh, that that authenticity is 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 guaranteed, and we prohibit also misrepresentation or misleading practices. And that is also extensible to our advertising uh, to our, our advertising practices. Co coordinated in authentic behavior, which is uh, you know at the core of uh, a lot of fake news discrimination, starts uh, very often with the creation of a fake account. So we're using technology that works every time, works better uh, to uh, to dismantle, to um, to uh, disactivate, uh, or not allow fake news to be to be created. 800 million and 754 million in quarter two and three. Uh, respectively, in 2018. It's a lot of accounts. Of course, reducing the spread of fake news is absolutely essential, and we work with third-party fact-checkers to do so. They, what they would do is that we give them signals, we give them uh, uh, what uh, automated tools, find out and uh, what our users tell us uh, to, this to d identify a certain type of problematic content, and they will determine uh, whether it's fake news or not. Once they have uh, rated that or they consider it inaccurate, then we will eliminate or reduce the, the spread of fake news for about 80%, uh, which is, uh, which is uh, has been, uh, we think, effective. We work with uh, uh, seven in uh, Europe and 34 globally. And finally, uh, just wanted to talk a little bit about ads transparency. That's also essential to, to our approach here and ads transparency, not only on political ads, but also in general ads. You, you can see uh, what ads any page on Facebook is running globally, if there's been a change in the name or the date. But we also, uh, on political ads, have gone beyond, and we require political advertisers, we will require them to uh, authorize, to be authorized. For that, we will, know we will need to confirm their identity and their location. They will need to put a disclaimer uh, to inform users who is paying for a particular ad and the creation of uh, an ad archive where we will uh, be able to have, everyone will have access to more information about the, the advertiser, the budget, who is being uh, exposed to that ad, the location, age, et cetera. So a lot on, the, on, the, uh, on, on that front, and this will come to Europe uh, before the, the, the European elections is already um, uh, active or it's already in place in the UK and, other and um, in, in, in Europe. So uh, last but not least, empowering the research community is absolutely key as well, and we're working uh, in ways to do this. There's an independent uh, commission uh, uh, that was created and uh, that is supplemented by a European advisory committee that is chaired by uh, a European professor from, the, uh, from an university in Amsterdam to make sure that the interest of the European academic uh, a community are also uh, considered when these draft with these proposals for uh, data are being are, are being designed. So all in all, just I run out of time. I think I went through, but just to note that our approach is one that is based on collaboration, on cooperation. That we need to address the key: what is the motivation of those who spread fake news. Uh, limit those fake news, work with uh, third-party fact-checkers, and empowering consumers. Finally, just to say we're members, uh, we've signed signatories of the EU code on, on misinformation that I know that Annie is talking about. And there's still uh, a lot to do, but I, this is just an overview of, of our activities so far. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Marisa. Um, next, let's hear what is the European Commission doing um, in this very important area. As I don't see the slides from here, I have to go there. Okay. Okay, hello everybody. The mic is on? Yes. And the slides will be on in a moment. Or not? Yeah, I got some security. Well, I start talking. Meanwhile, you find the slides. 
So basically, uh, the European Commission, uh, let's say we, s oops, oh, <laughs> we are making it more exciting for you. So uh, <laughs> anyway, um, you know, European Commission speaking, so we have to have a kind of a show behind, <laughs> so you stay awake. Um, we started with the issue of fake news uh, a long time ago. Like Johan said, we've, we've had our projects on contact verification already quite a while ago. However, in 2017, when our new commissioner, Maria Gabriel, started, one of the issues that she was addressed was that let's do something about fake news. And that was the word that was used then. So we did quite a lot of things. Eventually, we might even see them. Um, what we started with uh, checking the facts. What is the situation we have? Um, do we really have a problem in Europe? So we had a public consultation. And in that public consultation, we found out that people in Europe generally have two problems. One is that they don't really trust what they read and see online, or they have a problem with that. However, the other issue was that nevertheless, they, especially young people, they, they get their news from social media. So they recognize they don't trust this, this uh, thing. Uh, and they use it for their main news. So we realize that we do have a problem. And one of our problems seems to be solved. <laughs> so if you can, or do you have a, yeah, it's nice to be able to, you know. Okay, thank you. And then I'll just find out which way I'm going. Let's see. Okay, backwards. So this is what I was saying. Citizens uh, have been confronted with fake news. Um, they trust very little social networks and messaging apps. However, that's where they get their news from. So a problem. The problem is also a generational problem. My generation uh, learned to know that what we read is true. And now we need to learn that what we uh, read may not be true. And we need to teach those kids that, okay, they read things. The first thing they have to understand is at school is, by the way, what you're reading may not be true, and you need, need to learn to think about that. So that is one quite important thing, because apparently there may be very big uh, consequences for the fact that we don't realize that what we read may not be true. Here are some of the typical ones. I didn't change the picture. Vaccines, uh, Macron, uh, obviously Brexit. And it's a very scary thought that these things may partly have happened because people have believed on what they see online. Uh, why it is also interesting is that, um, I forgot to time my te myself, but I'm sure our chair is timing me. But as I had this problem in the beginning, I get extra minutes anyway. Um, but look at these communities. I mean, China has over a billion people. Facebook has I don't know the current amount as some have been taken away, but let's say 1.5 to, 1 to 2 billion people. That's a big community. If this community is only virtual and it reads things, and if we have a problem of what people believe and what the consequences are, we are facing big issues, and I'm going backwards, forwards. Okay, we needed to make a definition. This is uh, in order to tackle a, an issue, we need to look at it. What we decided to look at, first we leave out illegal content because there's a law against that. So that we left out. We looked at false or mi misleading information. That's there on purpose. Uh, the purpose is to get money or to get political power or public harm. What we have done is a communication which uh, proposes self-regulatory measures. We don't want to do regulation at this stage we look at collaboration. We have been uh, doing a very multi-stakeholder process. Code of practice, Facebook and other parties have signed to that. They did an enormous amount of work, uh, and we are very happy about that while more has to be done. Um, we are strengthening the fact-checking possibilities in Europe, where Jochen is part of, for example, one team. Media literacy, obviously, is for very important. New technologies, the previous speakers already said that research in this area <coughs> and new innovation is so important. And then, of course, the election processes are coming up. So all of this we are working on in the Commission. Um, code of practice has been signed in October uh, by uh, some of the major online platforms, uh, research engines, and, and so on. 
Additionally, also the advertisers, as you've heard, advertisers play a key role in what, what people see because there might be a benefit on the, on the, um, on the person putting the fake, fake website on by means of getting advertising revenue. And they are all collaborating in this code of practice, and we hope that that will work. Um, this is just a general thing what is happening now and what we are looking at uh, ahead in December. An action plan was published by the Commission, which uh, is in collaboration with the member states, working on improved detection of fake news and fake accounts, coordinated response to, to disinformation issues, working together with online platforms and ad industry, and then j raising awareness. So that's kind of a complete picture. Uh, code of practice indeed contains something on political advertising, on fake accounts, reporting disinformation, etc. cetera. Um, first reports have been already published. They were online on 29th, the day before yesterday, so you will find them online. And this, the reports are from social media saying what they have done already, how they have implemented the commitments they have in the code. Uh, a detailed report will be then one year from the start of the process. Fact-checking network, we are, as you see, there's a lot of fact-checking in Europe in many countries, and we are trying to get those uh, different activities together to work uh, commonly, especially as regards uh, elections, because this is so important. Media literacy, very important. Um, it's always been there, but now it's getting a higher profile, and we hope in the future to be able to fund more. Uh, new technologies on assessing ver veracity, embracing the new emerging areas, or let's say we have the deep fakes, everybody talks about them. We need to be able to identify those two, et cetera. So at the same time as we are seeing new ways of faking, we need to support European research and innovation to be able to f use the same technologies to, uh, against them and they're addressing them. I do believe that artificial intelligence will be very useful in this. Um, of course, the elections is now on uh, everybody's lips, the, the political pressure to do, to do whatever we can together with the member states to ensure that the elections will be resilient and, and uh, secure is the work that is ongoing now. That's it. That was fast. Right on time. <laughs> Thank you, Annie. And last but certainly not least, we have Alexandra from Logan University. Ah. Do you reach the... Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I would like to uh, bring in more abstract and academic approach um, and maybe play uh, the role of devil's advocate here. So I would like to focus on two questions. What are the policy implications of co-opting uh, private entities to regulate speech? Uh, and what should we do to make sure that freedom of expression is not undermined? Uh, but first, I would like to point out a few interesting elements in the Code of Conduct. Uh, Annie already mentioned some, um, so I'll try not to repeat, but uh, first of all, the Code is uh, mindful to the fundamental right to freedom of expression and to open inter uh, internet, and also to the delicate balance between um, of any efforts uh, to limit the spread and impact of information, uh, of lawful information. Uh, the code defines disinformation as verifiably false or misleading information which may cause public harm, but it does not, does not actually require the content to be legal. Um, the code is not meant to replace or interpret any existing legal framework, and in particular here the e-commerce directive provisions on intermediary liability uh, for third-party content. Um, and finally, the code highlights that uh, signatories should not be compelled by governments or uh, nor should they adopt policies to delete or prevent access to otherwise lawful content or messages solely on the basis that they're thought to be false. Um, so what the code actually does is co-opting private companies to regulate speech online. 
It's a similar approach as we've seen in numerous recent initiatives, like the Code of Conduct on Hate Speech, uh, amended AVMS Directive, uh, the new Copyright Directive, uh, and also the newly proposed regulation on uh, prevention of disseminating terrorist content online. But in this case, uh, the content covered by the code uh, does not actually have to be illegal, which means that code uh, allows for restriction on speech that is not unlawful as such. Um, the signatories don't have to remove content. They can merely uh, downgrade it or deprioritize it, but that still impacts the right to freedom of expression and access to information. Um, as the code points out, open democratic societies uh, depend on public debates that um, allow well-informed citizen to, citizens to express their views and make their political decisions based on that. Uh, but we should not forget that the right to freedom of expression does not only protect information or ideas that are favorably received or regarded as inoffensive, but also uh, those that offend, shock or disturb uh, the state or significant part of, of the population. So the code also says that platforms should prioritize the content that is relevant, authentic, and accurate, and authoritative. But it does not clarify who defines what content fulfills these criteria. Um, also, there is no information about the possibility to appeal a decision, uh, possibly incorrectly labeling content as disinformation. Um, we all realize that this is assessing content is not easy, not even when we talk uh, seemingly easier examples like terrorist content or hate speech. Um, so what happens if content is mislabeled as disinformation? So the code provides incentives to uh, restrict lawful speech, but also offers no remedies in case of uh, misid misidentification. Uh, so finally, okay, sorry. To fulfill some of the commitments of the code, um, certain certain monitoring activities may be necessary. For example, to detect bots or fake accounts. And to be clear, such monitoring um, under the code would not be obligatory but voluntary, which means there should be no problem uh, with the prohibition on general monitoring obligation contained in Article 15 of the e-commerce directive. Uh, but the same in the case of Code of Conduct on Hate Speech, uh, satisfactory ful fulfillment of the commitments um, in the code is used to put pressure on platforms to go beyond what they are actually required to do by law. And uh, only yesterday the Commission called on platforms to go farther and faster in their efforts to fulfill their commitments under the code. If not, they are threatened with regulation, um, and that provides a strong incentive to restrict uh, lawful speech. So what can we do to um, make sure that freedom of expression is not undermined? My suggestion would be to introduce a number of safeguards to uh, prevent excessive interference. Um, for example, mandatory notifications to the content provider in case of downgrading or removal should be considered. Uh, in such a notification, content provider would be informed that the content has been labeled as, it, as disinformation uh, and what actions has, uh, have been taken. Exceptions to these safeguards are also um, should be foreseen how, uh, for situations when sending the notification could hamper ongoing uh, law enforcement activities. Because we have to remember that even the code uh, does not uh, target illegal content. Some of some disinformation uh, can actually also be illegal content. Um, the notification should also inform content provider of his rights as well as any possibilities to appeal the decision. After all, uh, mistakes may happen and there should be a, a way to remedy um, incorrect labeling of, of, of messages. Um, and also to mitigate the problem of false positives occurring in case of labeling, which is done by, by automated measures, the appeal procedure 
uh, should include human in the loop to assess content manually um, in the e appeal process. Um, these are probably not the only safeguards that could be introduced in the code. We could think of more, but they, they seem to be like a low-hanging fruit, relatively easy to, to add to the code. Um, and to conclude, I don't mean to say that we don't have to do anything about this information, uh, but I would like to, to caution against unintended consequences that the code could have on legitimate uh, speech and legitimate public debate and democracy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Alexandra. Um, what a fascinating issue, I think. Um, and it is, I know it is this issue that is holding us and holding you from lunch, uh, but we have about 20, 25 minutes to uh, keep debating this, uh, I think, very important issue. The first thing before I open the floor to all of you is I would, last, I would like to ask the, all the panelists if you have any questions or any remarks that you want to say to what has been presented until now, including yourself. Yeah. Would you like to? Um, yeah, just, just a small comment on the, uh, thank you for the analysis on the code of practice. It's, it's very useful for, for us because w as, as everybody knows, there was a lot of time pressure to do it. Indeed, it will be something that will evolve and so on. Uh, one thing that I, as, as a, an operational te technical person, as, as the chair said, I'm a mathematician by background. Um, we have a lot of tendency to say that yes, this definitely we need to have the human decision on, on all of this, which is in a way essential. On the other hand, we have to remember the amount of information out there. So the more we can use artificial intelligence, um, the better. And it will be definitely impossible to think that we tackle this issue by only intervention, every intervention to have a human in it. So uh, I think at some stage the lawmakers will have to accept that there has to be also a level of automation. But what artificial intelligence is able to do now and in the future is, is uh, quite promising. I think we had similar discussions uh, in, ter um, in relation to the copyright directive and content, uh, the terrorist content uh, regulation that it's true, it's, it's great, it's getting better, but still there are mistakes. Um, so I'm not saying definitely that there should be manual assessment for every type of content, but for example, in the appeal process at certain point, that could be considered. Maybe if I can add to that, I sort of disagree, but then I disagree as well. Mm -hmm. um, because if you let the algorithm decide, then I mean, it's also a question to you lot, because you're all the le legal experts, who then is to blame? Who then takes responsibility? The one who's using that algorithm that filters out something, the one who's developed it, same as it is with driverless cars or so. So who is the one who is to blame? Who takes responsibility? We in the journalism field or media organization, or that, that's also my personal view, at least in the foreseeable future, there has to be the human in the loop because just purely letting the algorithm decide then exactly creates that question. Um, of course, algorithms can tremendously support and help here, and that's what we're doing. That's what I've out outlined in the research projects that we're doing. But the ultimate decision, at least at the moment and in the foreseeable future, what to publish and what not to publish, remains with a human being, with an editor who then can be also held accountable and responsible. Uh, yeah, Marisa, go ahead. I think I think this is it, it's all very interesting, and I think that it, the 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 use of of technology and how much you use technology and and machine learning to detect a certain part of of behavior uh, plays a different role depending on what case you're talking about. So maybe some cases which maybe are the easy cases where the link to freedom of expression it's not that direct where it, it you know you can deal with those cases with uh, with uh, with technology but uh, as we get closer to those where there is a, a free speech element you definitely need uh, that review but that but that is also the case 
Um, that is also the case, uh, distinguishing between what I tried to explain before, between behavior and content. A lot of uh, fake news uh, 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 distribution is done by bad actors, so you don't even need to get to the content. You need to even get to the whether there's a free speech component or not. It's the bad behavior yet that you're addressing. And in that, um, we, uh, it's we use, and it's, it's the, the use of technology is much, uh, is much more effective. Thank you. I think we have yeah. questions already. <laughs> yes, I. Yeah, I was. I'm gonna go. Yeah, open the floor because I had questions as well. But do you have a? I let's. <laughs> no, it's right. Let's do a maybe two or three questions at a time and see if we can organize this because there are a, few, a lot of hands. I think the gent. Well, we can start here. Please go ahead. Can you please say? Um, where you work, who you represent, and what, and if your question is addressed to one of the panelists, please specify that. Hello, my name is uh, Nico van Uyners. I work for the Flemish Parliament here in Brussels. Uh, my question is addressed to Marisa Martin. Uh, you opened your statement by saying that fake news is bad for business. Uh, I would like you to elaborate a bit more because uh, what Facebook does is sharing content. It can be a nice cat dancing. Uh, it can be news. Uh, I don't see why fake news would be worse than actual uh, news. Thank you. Can we, maybe the lady here at the front, please? Yes, yeah, yeah, he was great. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Eliska. I'm currently working for the Fundamental Rights Agency of the European Union. And uh, thank you very much for extremely interesting debate. Um, I have probably a very general question for all of you, really. Um, when we actually discuss the issue of disinformation, we speak about all these standards, such as targeting a specific age group, perhaps uh, trying to increase media literacy. But then when it actually comes down to it, um, I guess that more connected to this information are precisely the business models that these companies actually have. Whether that's a, a targeted um, micro-advertisement or micro-targeting or uh, specifically tailored political advertisement of the users depending on what they actually see there in their news feeds. So wouldn't be actually more effective approach to the issue or perhaps the uh, starting point to address uh, the details of the data protection and privacy and perhaps look at closely at the e-privacy um, e regulation. Um, and then the second question would be um, also for the uh, AI and algorithmic solutions, um, which is something that is being currently promoted, and I absolutely agree uh, that due to the low quality and high quantity of the speech, we might end up being forced using algorithms and automated solutions. However, how much actually these solutions are currently being tested and uh, their effectiveness and do we actually know really what works and what is failing and for what the users are paying with their fundamental rights at the end? Thank you very much. Thank you. So if I sum up the two questions, is an effective approach looking into the business models, e-privacy and the algorithm, how to use it in this context. Can we do the gentleman at the very back, please, because his hand was up first as before, sorry. And yeah, let's do these three and then we'll take another Hi, Michele Loi, University of Zurich. I'm a political philosopher, not a legal scholar. Uh, I try to ask a question that goes a bit at the meta level because I think that uh, irrespective of whether we use AI or uh, any other procedure, including legal procedure, we always face basically a problem of how much uh, value we attach to the false positives and how much value we attach to the false negatives. In a way, a culture that gives more value to freedom of speech is a culture that in a way thinks, well, I, I really, I'm really worried about the false positives. I'm really worried about the possi possibility of uh, ideas that contribute to democracy that may be stopped if we have, as a society, in our laws, in our practices, a, a too much restraint on communication. While a society that 
care may care about more the, f the false negatives and say, well, but if we let people uh, be less constrained in their communication, we may harm, uh, we may uh, offend other interests, as in the case of hate speech and so on. I think all societies face this trade-off problem of the false positives and false negatives. And different societies historically arrive at different solutions in their traditions, uh, and including the constitutional traditions. It seems to me that the meta problem is that so far, this really has been one of the salient questions of politics or of constitutional uh, law at the highest level. I mean, think about the famous court cases in the US that have defined the, the, the scope of freedom of speech. How can we accept that choices that are so important be delegated to uh, private entities and that they, they even use uh, methods such as what it's f called AI, which is a fashionable uh, label for something that is so far away from human intelligence when we really look at what we are talking about, machine learning with yeah. training. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so how can we let free speech be regulated by a private entity? Um, let's do a round of answers to these three questions and then we can quickly do a three more. I think we have a specific question uh, to Marisa yeah. from the Flemish Parliament and then to, to the entire panel. Thank you very much. So the question, the first question, why why fake news is, is bad for business? Uh, great question. Thank you for that. I, th the thing is, we need to depart from the fact of what what uh, our business is about, right? So we are a platform where people come to express their ideas, to connect with their friends, families, uh, to m build their interests, uh, to connect some that think like them and some that don't. Um, I might have a hobby, so I go and I have a group. I love, uh, for instance, uh, historical novels, so I, I, have, I, I belong to those groups with people that think like me or uh, and also many very differently politically. So it is a question, it, it is a place where people come to connect and we have to, we want to provide a platform where people feel safe, where they can all speak their mind. And, that, and, and, they, and we want those people that are in the platform to trust us. We know that uh, our users don't like fake news. Fake news, they, this to, they don't come to our platform to consume fake news. So we have to do what's in our mind to undermine this type of content because that's, that is not good for us. Uh, we do know, however, that many people use fake news and the distribution of fake news and go to the platform uh, to for some com for commercial gain. So one of the things, the first things uh, uh, at the very beginning of this process that we started doing is to cut those economic incentives for those uh, for those who spread fake news. It's spammers, it's people that use clickbait and ad farms and and you name it. So that's that's the first thing. There are other people that use fake news for not economic gain, but really to influence, to mislead, to deceive other people. This is why the, the misleading aspect of fa fake news is, is essential. And that is why our first approach is to go not after the content, but after the bad behavior. That's uh, number one. Um, so that's uh, the, the question on, on why fake news. On the business models, um, our business, I, I think I've more or less uh, answered that, but I, I'd like to, to note that we shouldn't please confuse, uh, or I would not want to confuse or anyone think that uh, the fake news issue is, an, is, a, is, a, is a privacy issue. I think that they are different ones and that we have to take them both seriously. So I'm not excusing myself by saying this, it's just I don't see the connection as clearly as you do, but I do see the importance of, of, of dealing with uh, with both, with uh, respecting privacy and user control again, but for the same reasons, for the uh, reasons of trust um, that I've explained before. And on AI solutions, uh, that is a little bit far from the, from the human, um, I think that uh, I, w when we talk AI indeed is, is a fa fashionable, um, uh, fashionable word, sometimes what we're talking is about a technology that detects patterns and technology that is uh, fed by signals such as the type of content uh, or the, uh, the type of content that a third, par a third party fact checker has labeled as inaccurate that is fed into the uh, learning model to help detect potential 
uh, fake news so that we can then, together with the feedback of users, can put it then back in front of the fact checkers so that they can do their job. So I think that in this case, it's, it's uh, a, a, let's just a, demystify, I would like to demystify a little bit of how that detection technology is, is, is used today. But I am, uh, um, uh, think the, the, the last uh, thoughts of uh, the philosopher in the room are uh, very, very valid and uh, completely uh, take them on board. Um, and the, t the truth of the matter is that in this particular type of content, this is so difficult, but because even though the commission has tried to define what fake news is, which is great, still, it is so uh, different. A sa uh, something can be an opinion or a satire or a hoax or really something that is really le uh, led to deceive. All of these things look very similar uh, and so it's really, really difficult. And the balance with free speech is a very, very, uh, very uh, difficult thing to do. So um, don't dismiss those comments and they're very, very welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Marisa. Um, Jochen, you want to? Yeah. Okay, coming to the question of business model, I mean, I'm totally biased in, in this one because, as I said, I work for a public service broadcaster, and our business model is to pre report as accurately and truthful, whatever that is, as possible. We don't always get it right, but we strive to do it, and we are lucky in a way that we do not rely on advertising dollars or advertising euros, so we don't have to please advertisers. On the other, ha other hand, we are dependent. We are dependent on viewers, on audiences, on eyeballs, so we have to also produce content that matters because if nobody watches, views, reads us, then why fund something like that? And um, this is going to, or this is a, a challenge, an increasing challenge, because our platform, I and mean, we've got our own platforms, we have DW, I don't know, you don't know, I mean, here in our hotel, we had DWTV, um, and it, it's often there somewhere, not usually on channel one, but on channel 95. We have our pl platform, DW.com, and so on. But the social networks, they are a main, a very important distribution, a means of distribution for us. So we are also more and more depending on the social networks to distribute our content. And we have very little, or we have no say really in what they do. So whenever there's a tweak in the algorithm, something happens to our uh, content on the reception of our content, and we don't see th into that. So there is an increasing dependence, and of course we'd like to have everybody consume our content by our own platforms, which we control, but this is not the world as it is, and there is a dependency. Um, so on the, um, what's the other one? On the matter of, oh yeah, um, data, you're saying data is another issue, um, not so much for us as a broadcaster, but in the projects that we're working um, on, what are the scientists, the research un um, institutes and university, but they tell us again and, and again and again, and that was also raised two days ago at a commission event, is access to data. So the accuracy depends almost exclusively on the data you can access. And that's also a black box, so researchers cannot access all the data they would need to redraw accurate conclusions from that. So it's also a call, I think, to all the platforms, not only to Facebook, but to all the platforms to give research access to data to see what really is happening, how information is spreading. Thank you. Um, was there any other comment you wanted to make from here? Yes, I just wanted to say about uh, the uh, issue of uh, data protection here and, and targeting. For me, it is uh, it is related, and the code definitely includes some commitments on this point, for example, um, that would allow people to see why am I targeted with this particular message. Um, so for me, that is definitely part of, uh, part of the problem, and we have to look into this as well uh, to find a solution, and I think that indeed the e-privacy regulation might um, help here, uh, and well, we'll see how <laughs> that all goes. Um, and as for the questions on AI and, and the decisions and the, the balancing, uh, indeed, it's, it's a huge problem, and for me this is like, you know, you can um, phrase, you can put the, the question of uh, the right to freedom of expression and access um, to information on, on both sides here. First, we need to, uh, for, for the well-informed citizens to make decisions, 
they need to they need to have accurate information and they need to have uh, truth truthful information to make decisions um, at the same time um, the so that's what I was trying to highlight that there's a lot of opinions there's a lot of content that might be mm, critical or controversial or offensive but it's not um, it's not illegal it's not it's it is still part of protected speech um, so it is indeed that that the balance that we have to find here between these two elements to ensure that both elements of, of the right to freedom of expressions are preserved. That's, that's very difficult. Thank you. Um, we're near 1 p.m., but since we started later, and I think there's a lot of interest in the room to keep talking, we'll run over maybe five or 10 minutes. I, I just wanted to share a very quick personal thought on this question of uh, human intervention. We, in principle, we agree, because we, uh, we don't think we can leave this whole debate in the hands of an algorithm. But then, if you haven't watched it, I recommend watching the documentary, The Cleaners to see a real life example of how this human controlled content moderation is happening or has happened. And maybe as an example of what is not the way forward. Can we get some questions? There's the gentleman in the center of the aisle here who's being patiently waiting and then here on the left. Thank you, my name is Mick Kosalo. Um, I had a chance to participate in a commission independent group that was trying to get grips of the whole of fake news problem. And uh, then I've been now trying to learn about the data world here and, uh, and, and, and GDPR. And I have one observation, and this is basically in the end the question to Facebook and on the excess of data that, that Jochen uh, said. Uh, that I see now at the moment that uh, the GDPR has actually kind of a, the legislation somehow hampers the, the, the progress on, on getting to the grips of the things at the moment. How, how is it interpreted at the moment? Because the, the researchers don't have the access, or is it used or integrated like that? Researchers don't have the, the access to the root courses and some of the wonderful tools that have been developed and completely independent of the, the platforms don't have the access to the data that the independent fact checkers like ours could use. So I think this is a huge trust question then and, and uh, how do we get to the, to, the, to the really to the sources of the things and, and, uh, and um, I wonder if you have any, any responses on that one, because we need that for to rebuilding trust. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, there was on the left a gentleman on the same row, or just here? Yeah. Uh, I'm Marcelo Thompson from uh, the University of Hong Kong. Uh, my question uh, 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 is both to Facebook and also to the, uh, to the commission. Uh, it concerns a certain uh, effort towards unplatforming. Right, what we have been observing uh, uh, in elections in Brazil, now in India, uh, a move towards end-to-end uh, uh, -end encryption uh, that we're going to see uh, uh, being uh, potentialized now with the unification of the different uh, messaging apps by Facebook, right? So WhatsApp, Messenger. Uh, so uh, how are you going to deal uh, uh, with uh, misinformation uh, in the context of end-to-end uh, -end encryption? Uh, and what are the solutions in this regard? Uh, and second, uh, uh, the question concerning bad actors. Uh, a platform that has uh, uh, two billion users. Uh, how, uh, we, I'm going to be speaking on a panel tomorrow on the BRICS countries, right? Uh, uh, and we have been uh, discussing the issue in other panels as of well, the social credit system. Uh, how do you define uh, what is a bad actor? Is there a threshold? Uh, 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 is a bad actor necessarily a bot? A bad actor can be a person? Uh, uh, are there uh, 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 processes for rehabilitation for someone ceasing uh, uh, to be a bad actor? Is there a score? So how do we define, how do we classify uh, what is a bad actor? Okay, thank you. There was a lady at the very back. Thank you very much, uh, Jordanka Ivanova, PhD candidate working on GDPR and artificial intelligence. My question is to Facebook and to Alexandra. Do you think that uh, now uh, this removal of uh, 
content of uh, users uh, is in fact in compliance uh, with the restrictions in the GDPR that forbid solely automated decision making when this has uh, legal consequences or similarly legal consequences when in fact the removal of this information can't uh, interfere with citizens' right of uh, freedom of expression. When this is not really uh, fake news, it is entirely legal content as Alexandra said, when this is done fully by an algorithm. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry, but I'm gonna close it there so we have enough time to respond and you can do some closing remarks. I'll take the opportunity that I'm for once in control of the algorithm to add one final question. I just wanna pick up on something that I think Annie and Johan have uh, picked on, which is media literacy. And uh, you know, I think as we spoke as about media literacy, we always have the reflex to say, oh, the young generations, we need to teach them about and so on. But Annie said something very, which for me is very interesting, which is what about the aging population? We've, we've always um, you know, kind of learned that what is in the media is true and now we have to unlearn that. I must say I have that with my mom all the time. Like she keeps forwarding stuff and I have to say like fact check, fact check this thing. Um, shouldn't we be doing media literacy for all ages? Yeah, who, yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, let's, let's, let's maybe do a round from yeah, Marisa this because way. Because <laughs> I'm sure you, you, a lot, you want to react to many yes, things. Yes, of for course, it. of course. So I'll, I'll, I'll try to be brief because there's a, there's a lot uh, here. So in terms of um, access to, uh, to Facebook and Instagram data, or in, in my case, uh, but also I guess to, to other platforms too, uh, by the research community, as I said, um, giving access to data is, is part of the solution to address this issue because as, as we said, w not only one company or one industry, one government is gonna be able to tackle to this. We need the research community, so we want to facilitate access uh, to that data. They have been, uh, but but we have to do it also, also in, a, in a sensitive way. We have to do it in, a, in accordance with our terms of service, the, the rules that we've all given ourselves in the use to use the platform. Um, I know that there has been some controversy over certain uh, workarounds, that, as they call them, um, uh, to, to access data, uh, certain data of the platform. And uh, we will have to see how, you know, w what that really is. Um, but but in, in I just want to say with a very little time that I have that the road here is for more transparency, not less. The way forward is for more access to data and not less, but it has to be done in a, in a sensitive fashion. Our, the work uh, that we're doing on the ads um, archive that's coming to Europe, the, the API that is also coming to Europe as, uh, as early as, as March uh, in, in, uh, in, in before the, the European elections, um, we think will change some of that. It's never going to be sufficient for some, but I think that we are in the right path. Uh, that we were not uh, just a few months ago. So that's on, on, the, on one side. On the end-to-end -end encryption, I think that uh, you would agree with me that users uh, want um, more messaging and to use you know, one-on-one -on -one or one-to-few communications in an encrypted fashion. And not only encrypted, like classic encryption, but also end-to-end. -end. And that sometimes has some disadvantages has it's some advantages, but it also has some disadvantages. In the new world where we're living, where end-to-end -end encryption is demanded, we need to find new ways to address uh, these, uh, these issues and the spread of misinformation. One of the things that, for instance, we did with WhatsApp in, um, in, in, the, in the and ahead of um, other elections was to, and this is now uh, overall, is to limit the times uh, that you, uh, you can forward a message, that you can also show the uh, recipients of a message that a message has been forwarded, that it is not a message that your friend has actually written himself, but that he's forwarding to you all to really give, provide more light as to what type of communications is happening within, within the platform. So these are some of the ideas that we uh, are, are, are putting into place and we think that are starting to be effective. Does it mean that that's uh, everything that we should do? Absolutely not, but it's just to, to say some of the things that, uh, some, some of the things that don't require uh, the processing of, of the content itself. Sorry, uh, I think media literacy is also important. 
And on removals, I agree with uh, you. We should not remove, and this is, should be very clear, we, not, we don't remove fake news. Um, we demote uh, fake news and we limit its distribution. But there's no removal of content here. Thank you, Marisa. I know, I know. Uh, go Alexander? Yeah. Uh, okay, so for me that's indeed definitely, uh, that's a very good question and for me definitely it's an uh, automated decision that impacts your uh, fundamental right. Um, and as far as I understand, uh, GDPR has some measures uh, um, specifically uh, in this regard. I am not an expert on GDPR, so I think I'll just stop on thi uh, at this. Um, I'm pretty sure that Yoris could give us more information on that. Uh, so if you want, maybe <laughs> I'll pass it to you. Well, maybe we do the... Yeah, yeah let's... Yeah. Yeah, he, Yoris can do it at the end, yeah. So, no, now, Annie? Any closing remarks? Yeah. Sure. Okay. Um, I will not address all the points that were here because I think my colleagues have, have partly addressed them. Um, the important issue is, is to understand that this is all about data, and it's all about immense amounts of data. And that's why we need to work together with the, the platforms, and we do need to develop more artificial intelligence tools. In the past, when car was, cars were created, or, or first cars were moving, there was a guy with a flag in front of the car so that it uh, doesn't disturb others. Um, we shouldn't do the same now in this world of big amounts of data, so we need to have realistic solutions. Just as my kind of final issue is that this year, from one year ago when the high-level group on fake news was set up until now, has been a year of massive development. If this panel would have taken place one year ago, we would have been so much less advanced in, in the things that we are doing. And also, um, the platforms have committed and have done a lot of good work. There's been a lot of fact-checking movement that has developed. Media literacy has become kind of a new topic that is at attracting also political interest, also luckily for the older population, but there I do agree we need to work, work more, especially with the elections. So I think we are, we are getting there. We are doing a lot of good work, and there's a lot of work to be done. So. Uh, from the Commission's viewpoint, I'm, I'm very happy for the collaboration that has taken taken place and started on this. Thank you, Annie. Yep. Okay, um, since some questions were not directed at me, rather at Facebook, I just leave those out. Access to data was one, yes, as I pointed out, it is a really tricky one. And also making that GDPR compliant, that's, I think, making some brains really burn, because on the one hand, we want to, or researchers want to and need to protect personal data. On the other hand, they just want as much data as possible. So if you just take away um, all the personal stuff, then the outcomes of your research is limited. So a dilemma. I don't have an answer to that, but I think that is really something to look into. Um, the other question, or one question that was addressed at um, WhatsApp and the like, so I'm not speaking on behalf of Facebook, just from a journalistic perspective, we see that more and more false information originates in closed networks, chat groups, and so on. Getting in there is impossible because they're encrypted, because they're kept private or so, but that is a real challenge. And ideally, from a just, again, journalistic point of view, we would like to see where false information generates, whether it's on 4chan or WhatsApp or whatever. But again, a tricky issue can't easily be <laughs> or can't be solved at all. Um, and the final one that was um, a question from Giamo, should media literacy be more or also taught to old people? A definite yes. I mean, I just found this study that was only released a few days ago or reported a few days ago. And again, um, you, take, you have to take it with a pinch of salt, but the headline was that um, older people and conservatives are responsible for the vast majority of fake news on Twitter. I mean, I'm just quoting the headline now. And I'm going into classrooms and teaching young ones, 10 to 16 year olds, so they are alert. But I'd, I'm not aware of many initi initiatives that go into old pensioners' homes or even into old <laughs> attract old, older people. I'm an old person myself now. Um, so, yes, that should also be done. And then maybe a final word um, we have talked a lot about collaboration and the need of collaboration, and yes, I'm also a strong proponent of collaboration, but please not at the expense of, in, in our case, of our independence, both politically and also 
economically and financially. Thank you, thank you all. Um, just one last word for me. First of all, thank you for a very constructive and uh, debate and conversation, and thank you all for your questions. It's been not very easy for me to participate only as a moderator, because as a, as a digital rights NGO, we take a lot of positions on all these issues. Just to tell you, we have, uh, together with European Digital Rights, which is uh, an organization here uh, based in the EU, and civil liber and, and liber an organization called Liberties, we have a report called Informing the Misinformation Debate that I just tweeted a while ago. And so if you're interested there, we explore more how to take a human rights respecting uh, approach to this whole debate. And with that, I hand over the algorithm to our dear chair. <laughs> Thank you very much. So I, I think I actually forgot to, oh, I forgot to introduce myself. So I'm Joris van Hoboek. I'm a professor of law here in Brussels. And work as a senior researcher at the Institute for Information Law in Amsterdam. And like uh, the, the question that was now delivered to me on the data protection, I think excellent point, excellent question. Uh, so the question of course is there, like what personal data processing is taking place? Eh? So it could be that that is a little bit of a tricky thing, but uh, one of the thresholds for the automated decision-making provision in the GDPR is that it has a significant impact. And since this, like if it is about removal or significant demotion of your uh, post, you could argue that there's something going on there uh, that, that maybe the GDPR can help to address. Uh, some people have started exploring this, and this is definitely something if you're a PhD candidate to keep lo uh, keep looking into. I want to finish maybe with some closing remarks. I, I'm, I'm, I'm coming out of the field of information law. My PhD research was on search engines and freedom of expression. And um, so um, the, the search engines are one of these platforms that have, like, that are the target of debate of, of disinformation and, and, and fake news. And I think, first of all, very important to realize for when you deal with these platforms and what they may be doing, the starting point is not neutral. They are already algorithmically mediating like everything that, uh, that is going on there. So it's like they may be adding or tweaking things. They may be adding different types of criteria to deal with, s with some of these issues, but it's not that you have some kind of neutral starting point and then you start to add some of these new things that are then become like incredibly problematic. These are platforms that tend to like have moderation and all sorts of ac accessibility governance at the heart of their operations. That's how they add uh, value to the environment. So I think that's first of all very important to, to realize. And then secondly, outside of maybe commercial motivations, you know, that we have also, that have come up in the debate, um, two ideals, I think, that these platforms have to um, kind of uh, find some balance uh, against. They have to address, they have to deal with in the operation. So one of them is access and effective dissemination of the content that gets posted online, making it findable for search engines, making like people able to reach each other and have conversations on social media. You know, the second one is information quality. You know, and it's like been a long discussion about how maybe classic forms of governance to deal with these types of ideals have broken down with like web communications. You know, the New York Times used to print everything that is fit to print. You know, you wouldn't able be, be able to just put your books in the library and have people like read them. It didn't work like that. We have all we had all sorts of checks that included information quality at the level of the content becoming availability available for public consumption. You know, so this doesn't work like that anymore. And there are many good things that result from that. But it creates, of course, a lot of issues is like how to really then effectively um, govern information quality in these uh, environments. So with that, I would like to uh, close the panel. Thanks again to all the panelists. And uh, please give them a round of applause and uh, we can go to lunch. Thank you.